Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel. My name is Colleen Carroll, and I'm a content publishing coordinator at Nexus Marketing and your moderator for today's panel session. Our topic today is let's get social, social media and fundraising. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation. But as usual, before I can jump into the topic, I do have a few quick logistics to cover. NX Unite is made in partnership with Nexus Marketing, and the NX Unite mission is to make introductions that lead to lasting relationships and serve as a hub for connection in the mission-driven sector. As you saw in our video, on NX Unite, you can find upcoming industry events, suggested influencers to follow, trusted solutions, cause-driven podcasts, and of course, panels with experts such as these lovely folks here with me today. Today's hour-long panel will include time both for questions curated by my team and questions from you all, our fantastic audience. So at any time during the panel, please feel free to start submitting your questions either via the chat or via the questions tab, and then we'll spend the second half of the panel answering as many as we possibly can. I tend to recommend the questions tab as they're a little bit less likely to get lost there, but either goes. And again, start submitting them now. The more we have early on, the more we'll be able to get to in that second half. If you're having any technical difficulties, please do let us know. My team member Malou is under the team NX Unite username and will do her best to assist. So give a little holler in the chat, let us know what's happening, and we'll figure out how to get you back on and enjoying the session as fast as we possibly can. I did also want to share that this panel session is being recorded. So if you get to the end of the session and the insight you heard was just so fantastic that you need to hear it a second time, uh, good news, it's going to automatically be in your email inbox at the end of the session. Give it a few minutes after we wrap up and that recording will be there. This panel will also continue to be accessible on the NX Unite website in the on-demand panel section. So if you have any friends in the industry who you're like, can't believe they missed it, they needed to be there, that session was perfect for them, please feel free to share that same registration page that you use to sign up and they'll be able to access the recording. All right, finally, before I introduce today's panelists, I do want to give a big thank you to our audience, whether you are joining us live and letting us know in the chat where you're calling in from, or you're watching the recording tomorrow, a month from now, a few months from now. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day. I hope this panel is beneficial, that you learned something uh, that already supports the work that you're doing, and uh, that you'll submit those questions if you are joining us live so we can tailor the conversation to your team's interests and needs. All right, to jump in with our introductions, I'd first like to introduce Carly Euler, who is the marketing manager at Memory Fox. Carly values the opportunity to elevate hundreds of nonprofits' missions at Memory Fox. She has held positions at the Wiley Network, Breast Cancer Coalition, Code of Support Foundation, Kenya Lacrosse Association, and the BOMA Project, where she has specialized in marketing, special events, communications, and fundraising. Storytelling has been an integral part of each role, and Carly currently lives in Rochester, New York, with her husband and her rescue dog, Sadie. Glad to have you, Carly. Also here with us today is Ira Horowitz, who is the co-founder of Corner Shop Creative, an award-winning online services company committed to listening carefully to their nonprofit organizations, political candidates, and small business clients. They're all about helping organizations make the most of the web. With over 20 years experience, Ira is an expert in nonprofit digital communications and digital fundraising, and his work has resulted in increased funds and resounding supporter engagement for hundreds of organizations. Glad to have you, Ira. And finally here with us today is Nick Black, the co-founder of Good United. Raising more than $1 billion for nonprofits, Good United is the first conversational messaging solution that powers two-way communication between nonprofits and supporters in the supporters' preferred channels, social networks. Nick started Good United after co-founding Stop Soldier Suicide, a 501c3 in 2011, and growing it to be one of the largest and leading veteran service organizations in the country. Glad to have you, Nick. All right, we are going to jump in and get started. And Carly, I'm going to have you start us off with our first question. How have best practices for nonprofits related to social media changed over the past few years? Yeah, sure. I'd love to kick this off. I have a lot of thoughts on it. Um, first, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, but yeah, the rules have really changed. I would say that it, even back in like 2015, we all thought hey, there's just a few things we can do and we're going to break the algorithm, right? And that's post every day. We're going to post early in the morning. We're going to post a graphic. And we're all like, we can do this. And we did. And it worked for a lot of us. Um, but, you know, the rules have changed. Even if we do that now, all those things religiously, we're just not going to get the engagement that we always used to from doing those things. And I'm telling you first, stop beating yourself up about it. It's happening everywhere. So it's not you. 
And um, I would say that my advice is I am a big proponent of thinking more about your social media channels as a landing page instead of the primary way to get your information out. And by that, I mean, you need to take your four prime real estate options on your social media channels. Those are your profile picture, your cover photo, your bio, and your pinned posts. And make sure that you're getting out that message that is going to bring that very new person into your mission to understand the everything you want them to know just in those four places. Um, so I would say that is a thing that I've been recommending to people to really just start rethinking how you think of your social media channels and just working on those four real estate um, properties and bringing them to the next level. Awesome, thank you so much, Carly. I think that's a great place to start. Ira, over to you, thoughts on how best practices have changed over the past few years? Yeah, I, uh, thanks again for having me as well. And I think Carly, uh, you know, hit the nail on the head there with, with you know, that, that focus of around frequency and, and how much you're doing it. Um, I think these days, the real focus and what we emphasize to our clients is really to focus on that engagement. Um, Think of what users are coming to those social media platforms for and work to engage them. If you just use your traditional, we need a donation because of X, um, it's not going to really engage people. It's not going to make them want to donate or get involved with your organization. Whereas if you actually focus on real tactics, if you show them that there's a person behind the, the social media handle who's actually there and thoughtful and funny and engaging and cares about the issue, um, then that tends to be a lot more of, of an effective tactic um, that we're seeing these days is really, again, as Carly said, focus on that landing page, focus on getting them into your organization, into the conversation, and then you can go from there to, to, to get into the other actual uh, commitments of whether they're donating or taking action or attending events, learning more, uh, whatever your, your call to action may be. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ira. All right, Nick, over to you. Thoughts on how the past few years have changed best practices related to social media? Yeah, for me, it all comes down to revenue. From a board member and a founder point of view, uh, you know, I've been at it for over a decade. Uh, for the first six or seven years, seemingly our marketing, people talk about impressions, brand, likes, followers, and I just fundamentally don't care. Right. But the shift has been that now that marketing, especially social, is now a driver of revenue, right? And leading revenue. The communities that we built for over a decade that we continue to post content into, now we can monetize them in the socials where people are spending time. So for me, it's about marketing, getting a seat at the table and really being a driver of one leads to revenue. And then three, uh, you know, one of the big growth areas of, of each mission and each nonprofit. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Nick. Very quickly for our live audience, I want to let you all know that we've had a poll go live. We've asked you, how has your nonprofit social media practices changed over the last five years? So kind of letting you all contribute to this conversation. I see that one of you has already found it and said that it's vastly different from the past few years, but excited to hear from everyone else. All right, Ira, I'm going to bring another question to you. If nonprofits want to evaluate their current social media strategies and how they support larger fundraising strategies, what advice do you have? Are there any gaps they should be particularly looking out for? Yeah, great question. Um, so I always recommend start, you know, go to outside uh, sources as well. You know, if you're, especially if you're working on evaluating what you're doing, um, bring in consultants, bring in board members who might have uh, an expertise in social media um, and really get that outside opinion of what people think, what people are looking for uh, when you want to engage with them with social media. So that tends to be the first thing that I, I uh, start on. Uh, the second is is kind of going after that volume. Um, fundraising, especially with with any type, is is uh, is really difficult, and you're going to typically get a low conversion rate. Um, typically, less than one percent of your people are going to donate. Uh, you know, if you post it on social media or you send out an email, and so um, I tend to you know encourage and and recommend strategies, especially for a lot of the smaller nonprofits, to try to build that list, build your your social media following, so that you have enough people that when you when it does come time to ask for donations that you have a big enough pool of folks that you can draw upon and make sure that you're uh you know getting out in front of them and actually uh increasing in that revenue that you're you're looking for so um those are a few things that i uh start with i have a few others but i'll, I'll let carly and nick chime in as i'm sure they have others too sounds good and if you want to jump back in at the end ira you are more than welcome yeah. to <laughs> 
Nick, over to you. Thoughts on evaluating current social media strategies when we're particularly looking at how it supports a larger fundraising strategy? I draw a lot of inspiration from MNR benchmark reports. So they come out annually with a pretty good analysis uh, broken down by segment of nonprofit from large to medium to small. And I think for me, it's all about opportunity costs. So with that, you got to figure out where to allocate your capital. And I think the most important part for a nonprofit that unfortunately, rarely I've seen organizations do is define what right looks like. Is 200% return good? Is it bad? Is it 50? Is it 400? Right? If you don't have a benchmark for what you're trying to drive against, then you're never gonna be able to optimize towards it. So one, figure out what the benchmarks are Two, start the test. And then three, right, make sure you're optimizing and investing against a certain number rather than just kind of going forward and seeing what happens. Great, thank you so much, Nick. All right, Carly, over to you. What should we be looking out for when we're evaluating our strategies? Sure, so the, I would say the number one thing for me is to make sure you know your audience and by that, in your case, would actually be your donors. And you wanna make sure that you're going where they already are. So if the age of your average donor is 45 and above, I wouldn't necessarily recommend you hop on TikTok right now. Like maybe some other time that makes more sense for you. But if you're looking for like turn uh, turnaround right now, probably not where you're going to find your average donor. Um, and I would say one thing that we haven't touched on, um, you said maybe what are some gaps that we should be looking out for? Um, one thing that I think is a gap that is very easy to overcome is make sure that you are thanking the sponsors of your organizations or of your events really far ahead of time. So if I'm having an event in the fall, I'm going to start posting thank yous to them as early as May because I know that businesses are most likely to interact with me on social media. They're going to repost the information about my event, especially if I put their logo on the nice branded thank you graphic for them. And in that way, I'm going to just heighten the brand awareness and the event awareness and ultimately lead to more funds. Fantastic. Ira, did you I want to chime in? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> uh, so I was going to chime in and it, it kind of uh, expanding on what Nick was talking about um, of, uh, I think it's also important to really focus on some of the technical aspects as well of making sure that you have a way to track your conversions, um, whether that's through Google Analytics UTM codes or through a dedicated donation form, um, but making sure that you do have all those technical assets set up and configured so that you're not struggling to you know, to track and determine what your actual benchmarks are and uh, how well you're performing now. So uh, that's just an, another thing that I, I like urging people, especially when you're evaluating um, what, what you're supposed to be doing next. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ira. Very quickly, I want to jump back to that poll just to kind of check in on where we are. So again, we asked how has your nonprofit social media practices changed over the last five years? 38% of you said it's vastly different. 32% oh, we have more people voting. 32% have said mostly the same, but with some upgrades. 27% say pretty much the same and 5% say fairly different, but with some noticeable similarities. So we are all across the board today, which is pretty exciting. All right, Nick, I'm gonna have you start us off with our next question. If a nonprofit currently has no social media strategy related to their fundraising strategies, where should they start and what should they consider? If they have no strategy, uh, take a step back and figure out who is your audience. Um, so I think with that, it's about testing. Um, you want to make sure you understand who's resonating with your cause. Um, as an example, at Stop Sort of Suicide, you might think that our primary audience is veterans. What we built is a brand that the average person, I think between 45 and 55 year old female, right? But we created sub brands to go after different demographics. So I think it's taking a step back and really trying to figure out who you're resonating with and why. Right, you need to resonate with people that are going to donate. You also need to resonate with people that might be attracted to your mission, and that those unfortunately aren't always the same thing. So uh, you can't go wrong with uh, doing the discovery to figure out who those customers are, for lack of a better word. And then from there, uh, I'd start to figure out content in a small group that resonates with them. So instead of posting, you know, get a couple friends that you know represent that demographic and start to rapidly test on what does fit and what does not fit. Uh, once you get a good feeling for that, then just go forward and start executing. Great, thank you so much, Nick. Carly, over to you. Any advice for those who are just kind of getting started building their social media strategy? Sure, I would say very similar to Nick, what I like to do if I am starting creating my social media framework for, for an organization 
is I like to implement a structure of intent. So just like he said, resonate, I use the word intent, same thing. Um, but really what I would say about that is if I'm going to plan to post four times a week, for example, what are those four posts? What is the intent of each one of those posts? And they should be different. So the first, you might want to do an educational post and a promotional post and an emotional post and then a motivational post. And the motivation in this case would be your call to action. Maybe it's your fundraiser, donate here button. And you just want to make sure that you are giving people consistency, but a, that you want to walk them through a roller coaster of intents. And then in that way, they see your whole mission um, throughout the whole week. Fantastic. All right, Ira, I think you know what question is coming your way. Thoughts on building a social media strategy from scratch? Yeah, that's great. And and Nick and Carly obviously address many great things that that are, you know, definitely uh, where I'd start as well. Um, you know, a few other thoughts that I've had is is when you are thinking of what content or how to message those individuals, you know, really, again, stepping outside of your brand is is always a good idea that you don't want to seem like people don't want to engage with or talk with an organization. They want to engage with individuals and they want to, you know, focus with the, where the passion is. So, um, you know, coming up with with content that's going to work on that engagement piece that's going to get them involved, just, just like Carly was talking about. Um, when it comes time for the ask, make sure that it's something that's urgent and timely. Um, that's typically a lot more effective with your fundraising strategies is if you're giving people like, you know, this urgent thing needs your support is going to be a lot more effective than, hey, we just need money. Um, and so really thinking of that, that urgency, um, giving people deadlines and, and some of those, those more traditional fundraising uh, resources. Um, also with your audience, one great tactic is, is to utilize um, uh, influencers and uh, other resources that you may have in your community. So whenever I'm growing a, a, a social media strategy, I think of who in our audience, who in our sphere is going to be, is going to help amplify our message and is going to be one of those people who's going to, going to expand it and, and repost it every single time and work with that, that group of people, form it as a committee and, and make sure that they're aware and are, are reposting on your behalf. Um, that can be people internal, like your staff and board members, um, but it could also be external if you have, a, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a celebrity spokesperson or something, uh, those can be really, really valuable uh, in, in your uh, fundraising. I'll hop in here. I totally yeah. agree with what Ira said. And I would say even take that one step further, if you are the one who is managing the communications channels, um, after you've posted everywhere that message that you want to get out and the message that you want people to share pull up your email send them those exact links to those exact posts so it's very easy for them to click and share even if you have to include the instructions of how to share the post i've had to do that before like some people just truly don't know um the the little things about social channels like that so um i would say just as much as you can empower those people to be and share the exact the exact uh, message that you want that that's the better. Wonderful, thank you for that addition, Carly. Uh, Nick, did you want to jump in as well? Yeah, you know one of the interesting things that you know one of the theses behind Good United, but I'll, I'll spin it from a stop source side point of view is that we build a pretty strong community in social channels, and what we figured out was trying to remove friction at every single step of the user journey or the follower journey. And as such, being able to convert people from a follower into a named user right through Messenger. And then with that, we start to figure out who are the people really engaging with our content. And it's always amazing me, to me when you ask, right, and whether it's fundraise or to share a post, they'll do it. And I think that's the power of these social networks is that you can leverage them in channel. And the functionality is pretty slick. Uh, nothing that, you know, you're going to have to beat with, you know, the best engineers on the planet to recreate. Um, and you know, keeping it in channel is pretty powerful. Great, thank you so much, Nick. All right, we've had another poll go live. We've asked you, have you ever faced pushback from leadership or the board in regards to social media? Some of you have already found the poll and it seems like about 70% of you, though it's now just changing, have said that you have faced pushback before. So that's great because that sets me up well for this next question. And Ira, I'll have you start us off. Do you have any advice for nonprofit professionals who may be struggling with getting the board or leadership on board with dedicating team time and energy specifically towards social media? Yeah, uh, so 
I always, um, you know, if you're you're trying to convince people what it's worth, I always focus on uh, showing them the ROI, showing them, you know, what the benefit of of engaging people through social media is going to do to the mission and what what they're there for. And um, you know, the M and R benchmark study is a great one. There are others. If you, uh, a lot of the uh, donation uh, fundraising platforms uh, provide their own reports. So I know Classy has one, and Blacklot has another. Um, and showing them the impact that if we do this, we can then be leveraging and and increasing our fundraising in this way. And so, uh, you know, really connect it back to what their goals are, which I assume their goal is looking to increase fundraising and and grow the organization. So just really connect it back to their goals and um, you know, showing them outside uh, expertise that that shows that it's it's an effective tactic uh, tends to be the way to 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 get it. But as Carly was saying as well, um, you know, a lot of times board members will think, well, oh God, I'm gonna have to repost everything, and I'm gonna spend my whole life just just posting stuff on social media now. Um, but as Carly said, there are ways to make it easy for them. But you can provide them the script, you can provide them everything they need, that you can show them or tell them when something's going out so that they have all those resources in one place. So uh, definitely a, a, a way to kind of address some of those potential concerns before they even come up is just emphasizing how easy it's going to be for, for them to, to participate and engage in this. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Ira. Carly, over to you. Thoughts on getting the board or leadership involved and on board with social media? Sure. I would say that first and foremost, I would just remind them of the power of storytelling. Um, I would ask them, why do you support our organization? It's probably not because they know the statistic of uh, what percentage of overhead is more is the overall of your whole budget, right? It's probably because they have a story that resonates with them about your organization or about their life that reminds them of the work that you do at your organization. And the stories are going to be told over social media, and that's how you're going to raise more funds. Um, I think um, where it comes into the time and the energy specifically, trying to overcome maybe those barriers, um, we need to start letting technology help us maybe there that used to take a long a lot of time out of people's days and a lot of their energy but now we have technology solutions like memory fox for example that is built specifically for nonprofits we have you in mind thinking about what you specifically need to overcome during the day and um i'll just wrap that up with if if you are thinking about um you know how storytelling maybe will take too much time um, but and you, that just means that you have to rely on your impact numbers. And while those impact numbers are going to sound like really fantastic to you because you work in the mission every day and you know that you increased 200 percent over the past two years, um, the outside community isn't going to be able to contextualize those impact numbers without a storytelling component. So it's really it's it's not an option not to buy into the power of storytelling at this point. And I would just recommend using technology solutions to help you overcome those barriers. Wonderful. All right, Nick, over to you. Thoughts on getting the board on board with social media strategy? Uh, well, as a collective on the board, don't. Uh, someone told me a couple of years ago that as a board member, you need to provide work, wisdom, or wealth. Pick one. Um, as such, you need to manage against it. Uh, if it's wealth, stroke a check, right? Once a year, this is what you need to do. If it's work, uh, generally what I've seen gone well is, or that, that's happened well is someone that really resonates with the cause. Maybe they're famous, maybe they're well known. Um, they could really be a powerful player um, in that piece, whether help us with the strategy or being a megaphone for what you're doing. Um, and then the wisdom piece, maybe they can help you with that strategy. There's a lot of really talented uh, for profit people out there that would love to join the board. Uh, but in my experience, the reason they don't is because it's not defined what exactly they need to do. So if you approach someone that's really squared away that has a background in marketing, especially social, and say, you know, what I need you to do is your wisdom. Right. You need to help me build out a marketing a strategy. Uh, I think they'll do it. Um, so I think that's how I'd approach it. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. For the 70 percent of you, 70 plus percent of you who mentioned that you have faced pushback from uh, leadership or the board on social media, I hope that is helpful. For the lucky 27 percent who have never faced pushback, maybe share your wisdom in the chat. We would love to hear uh, because that's awesome um, in that case. Please ask the questions that are relevant to you and we'll address them. 
this is a good time to remind you all. I have one more question from my team that I'm going to ask, and then I'm officially opening this up to the audience. We have some questions that you all submitted via registration, but I will prioritize questions from our live audience. So if you have any burning ideas, thoughts, concerns that you want to have our uh, panelists address, please submit them via the questions tab. I know a few have come in, um, and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. All right, Nick, I'm going to have you start us off with this final pre-prepared question. For our nonprofit professionals uh, who are very busy, what small change to their current social media and or fundraising practices could they make today that could potentially have a really big impact? If you're on Facebook, turn on Facebook Giving Tools. If you're not using Facebook Giving Tools, it's like having a website with no ability to donate. I like it. Short and sweet and easy to do today. Thank you so much, Nick. All right, Carly, over to you. Any small changes that nonprofits could make today or in the near future that could have a really big impact? Definitely. First, I would say, um, going back to those intents, um, don't sleep on sending out educational content. Even your biggest supporters are not going to know every single thing you do to perform your mission at your organization. So you need to make sure you're constantly giving them reminders of everything you do. It's not just the one thing that maybe they personally know about. Um, and it's really easy just to create a short little reel about with a little bit of information on it. Just go on Canva. Canva's free for nonprofits. You can do that. And if you have Memory Fox, we're integrated with Canva, by the way. And then um, my next piece of advice would be to reuse content and reuse copy. So your program staff talks probably all day about the things that they do. And they have ways that they talk about it in ways that resonate with people. So let's use the way, let's help have them help you write that copy to explain what they do. Um, you probably have a grant writer who has written your mission thousands of times. Um, why aren't we using those words again? We don't have to be all siloed in our own departments. Um, so yeah, just I would just say don't reinvent the wheel there. Reuse your content and reuse your copy. And then um, my third one is, I see this a lot, but I would say make sure your fundraising appeals double as social posts. Those stories that you spent so much time on and send out to people to raise money, they don't have to just live on a piece of paper in the mailbox that somebody got or just in an email. You can create a series, you can create a carousel, you can create several reels telling that story. And um, again, you're just reusing that stuff you already worked so hard on. So um, your team already yeah, spend all their time on it. So let's just reuse it and make sure that it's having as big of an impact as you hope. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carly. Ira, over to you. Thoughts on small changes with big impacts? Yeah, um, I like incorporating both social media and fundraising and, and basically uh, everything that you, that you do. You don't have to like create dedicated fundraising or social media campaigns. You can just do a little bit to expand the work that you're already doing. So uh, if you are run a, you know, a gala or an event in person, just making sure that you're, you're in developing what that social media strategy could be and, you know, even if it's just doing a few posts throughout, um, you can get even more creative and do competitions and say like, you know, donate $5 and you'll be on the live screen or something like that uh, during the event. Um, and, you know, various little challenges and small tactics that, that can work to engage people and incorporate social in the work that you're already doing. Um, another great tactic is, you know, on the forums or, or if you're, you're, you know, say you're an advocacy organization and people just took action, making sure that that next step is great. Now post about this on social media or make a donation um, so that you're fully, um, you know, thinking of those things as you're running the rest of your campaigns and tactics that you're doing. Fantastic, thank you so much, Ira. All right, we are officially moving over to our audience question portion. It is not too late to keep submitting those questions though. We have some time, so send them in and we'll get to them as we can. Uh, Carly, first question for you from our audience. Uh, you mentioned earlier that social media should be considered as a landing page. Do you feel that time should continue to be spent on websites as the landing page or spend time increasing the presence of social media? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, and to that, I would say a lot of your copy can be reused in both places. Um, and actually, I would recommend that because you want to have your branding matching. You want people to, when they go to their your Facebook page and then they click on the next step, which would be to go to your website or your donation page, 
you don't want them to take a step back and be like, wait, is this still the same org? Did I click the right link? It needs to look, you know, pretty much the same with the same message. And you want to make sure that people know exactly where they are. And yeah, I just think, um, does that answer that question? I think so. Ira, I was wondering if you would want to jump in on this in terms of balancing time between social media and web landing pages. Yeah, and you know, obviously we all have limited resources, so sometimes you do have to make some of those those difficult choices. Um, for me, it comes down to where your audience is and where you see the biggest return on on that investment. Um, you know, websites are not going away, um, and they are still the driver for a lot of engagement and traffic, and you know, a lot of times where you're going to be getting people. So I would I would not really recommend uh, it, it, you know ignoring that or or not focusing on the landing pages there, um, especially especially because there are great tactics like SEO can be utilized on your website. Uh, if you do optimize it, you can get more organic traffic who, who might not be on social media or might not be looking there. So um, just, yeah, I, I encourage prioritizing both. And, and as Carly suggested, reusing what you can to create that brand consistency and, and uh, same thing with your marketing and your messaging, uh, you know, as you're adding a new feature image to your homepage that's talking about the latest fundraising campaign, take some of those words and add them to your social media profile and uh, you'll, you'll see double benefit and, and get a lot of engagement. Wonderful. Nick, anything you want to add to this question? Otherwise, I'll have you start sure, us yeah. off with our next one. I think the, the brand consistency is absolutely paramount and I absolutely agree. Um, one of the areas of reason why I started Good United was because of the experience of sending people from in social channel out to website which reduced in friction of the user journey that created churn, that created high cost to be able to convert on the website. So what Good United has done is replicate all the functionality of a landing page within the social channel so you can experience seamless giving and seamless acquisition. Um, so as I see it, right, uh, we have a social media calendar. We spend a lot of time, money, and effort building community and posting in these channels. Uh, we want to keep people where they are. And to me, that is absolutely paramount. And whether it's Facebook or TikTok or your website from search, right, wherever people are spending time, don't ask them to leave. Just engage with them where they're at, and you'll see a much higher conversion than if you did. If you go to someone's favorite bar and say, hey, you know what? I know you love it here. I'd like to take you somewhere else. It's not going to go well, right? So keep them where they're at and where they're engaging with your content. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Follow-up question for you, Nick, from our audience. Uh, in general, how often is too often to ask for donations? Um, I think, well, it separate the two different segments. One is, you know, probably a one to many from your social page. And then one is one to one. Uh, so I think on a one to many, uh, it depends on the type of ask. And I think that's the important piece is you want to differentiate how people can get involved in a financial aspect. Um, what I found is that fundraisers from stop sort of suicide do not have a high return, but if we can get 10 people to start a fundraiser, we'll see magnitudes and exponential growth from someone starting a fundraiser rather than SSS. So I think there's a lot of power in peer-to-peer. -peer. I think there's a lot of different variations. Um, I don't know if you all get those text messages from politicians, right? And they said, the world is going to end on Saturday if you don't give me $10, right? What they do a wonderful job with is creating that sense of urgency, right? That moment, like you need to give. And I think nonprofits can learn a lot from that, whether it's, you know, Mental Health Awareness Month or Veterans Day or Memorial Day or whatever resonates with your cause. How do you create these senses of urgency that creates a lens or a different way to think about fundraising rather than the never ending drip of donate, right? Like no one wants to do that. They want to be a part of something. They want to see change as such, create that story and that narrative for them to play a role in. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Carly, over to you. Thoughts on how often is too often to ask for donations? Yeah, I agree with Nick. I think, um, I think the real question here is, is donating is donate your only call to action which it shouldn't be so you should probably have a call to action like once a week on your social media but that could be something totally different maybe it's maybe this week's call to action is just learn about our volunteer opportunities learn about our upcoming event um, sign up for our newsletter to stay engaged on more news um, learn about you know the new program that we're introducing so the it's it's hard to say there is no hard or fast rule about how many times to ask for money, but I would recommend that making sure those call to actions are not just about donating and are also what Nick was saying about bringing in that person to be a part of the call to action is super important. So making them feel like if they do decide to give, whether that's time or money 
um, or just uh, sharing for awareness, that is going to make your mission better. And as long as they feel like they are really helping out your mission in any way, whether it's big or small, um, they're going to they're going to do it. It's um, I, yeah, there isn't like a one. I would say at least one call to action a week, but the call to action seem to be different every week. Great. Thank you so much, Carly. I feel like it's come up in past panels, kind of thinking of not just your donors, but them as supporters, because there's many different ways to get involved and often a really um, energetic and enthusiastic supporter will become a donor very quickly um, yeah. if you kind of cater to them earlier. Sorry. You know, one thing I'd like to add in addition to that, it took me eight years of just getting absolutely crushed to figure out that the difference between asking someone for a donation and asking for an investment. Right. A donation is never ending. An investment is that you give me X, I will drive Y. And I think there's a lot of nonprofits that can learn to define a mission. Right. What is your annual mission? What is the point of your organization? And I bet you'll find a lot better return if you think of it as an investment where the supporter or the investor gets a return rather than the never ending call for cash. Because there's a lot of big brands out there that are very good. And I don't know if anyone on this call has a balance sheet that can compete with ASPCA or St. Jude. So like we have to think differently and we have to make it more tangible. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. Ira, anything you want to add to this conversation on the ask of donations? Otherwise, I'll have you start us off with our next one. Yeah, I mean, I think they they said a, they said a lot of it. Um, I was just going to kind of reference. I mentioned SEO and what Google always says when when you're, you know, ask them, like, what's the algorithm with with SEO? And they always respond that it's it's build good content. Um, and that's really what um, I think you need to be doing here is, is building good content, good messaging and, and good uh, uh, engagement so that you can get people. Um, one tactic that I do like as well is that, um, that that kind of builds that is when you do ask for money is making sure that you're reporting back on that impact. Um, if people don't know exactly what, what Nick and Carly are saying, if they don't know where their money is going or what's happening as a result of it, they're not going to go Nate again next time. And so you want to be reporting back and providing them with constant updates of here's where here's what we did, here's how we were effective, so that next time they can kind of remember that, have that in the back of their heads, and say, oh, when I donate to this organization, it's doing important work. Yeah, and actually, I'll just step back in here but you're exactly right and one of the best ways to show those people those impact is to collect those stories from the people who are being impacted and literally send them back to the donors like that's what they want to see and that's what they want to hear so let's do it and uh you know memory fox does that for people S send them back to the donors and create milestones right so if you can get 100 people to donate 10 dollars, we need x amount of money to reach milestone one and then you celebrate it. Like we did it. We did it. Milestone one. Now milestone two, come back, 10, go to 20. I need you at 20, right? So like you talk about current giving, you have to create the plan, the narrative, the milestones to be able to expect people to want to participate. Wonderful. All right. We had a question come in via registration that I'd love to talk through. And Ira, I'll have you start us off. Uh, the the registrant asked, how can we use social media and our web presence to reach new audiences instead of engaging people who already follow us and engage with us? That's great. And, um, you know, each one of those web and social are very different. Um, I, you know, uh, have expertise on both. I'll, I'll kind of address the social uh, web part first is, is, um, I think there are a number of tactics that you can do, and I, I addressed it with the last question there of, of building good content of if you're doing the right things to uh, engage your supporters on the web, then you're going to rank high in Google um, and you're going to rank high in Bing, and that's going to get more people to your website. And assuming you have the right call to actions, uh, then you will get them to the donation form or, or uh, education pieces, where, whatever you're looking for. Um, so for me, that's where, where it comes down to is really optimize for how people are searching for you, um, incorporate a lot of those phrases and a lot of that work. Um, do other tactics like um, Google ads and, and uh, other engagement tactics to uh, utilize your supporters and get them out there um, so that they're bringing their friends and their supporters back to your website. Um, and that, that's where I like starting on social media is a lot of the campaigns that I've done with organizations have focused on 
uh, building that list, building the volume and supporters. And so going after uh, not necessarily asking your individuals for money, but asking them to help broaden your support and get other people in there. Uh, working with influencers or other other prominent figures in your space to make sure that they're posting and and communicating your message effectively. So uh, those tend to be the the areas that I focus on um, in both social and web. But uh, they they can work very very hand in hand with one another as well, which is which is always nice. Wonderful, Carly. Over to you. Any thoughts on engaging new audiences? Sure, I'll even take it one step further back than Ira did, and that is if you are not using video content yet, you seriously need to get on board. That is what is being prioritized on all channels. Um, maybe you don't know this, but if you are using um, video content, short form video content, so 30 seconds or less, you're going to put that on Facebook or Instagram as a reel, and those are going to be put out to people who don't necessarily like your page. In fact, it's going to be put out based on what you write in the caption, what is uh, actually going on on the reel. So those that's another way of basically using SEO to find new people, but through social media. And um, I, I think it seems like it's going to be super hard to break into switching over to reels and, and maybe time consuming or confusing, um, but I really just recommend giving it a try. It's a lot easier than you think. Like I said earlier, Canva has all these templates. You can just drag and drop your photos, your videos in. Um, give it a try. See how it goes. You're, you're probably, I think you'll be happily shocked by the amount of, of views you'll get on it. And um, yeah, I just think that if you're not on that train yet, you got to get on board. Absolutely. Nick, anything you want to add in terms of reaching new audiences? No, I think Ira and Carly crushed it. Awesome. In that case, I will ask you our next registration question, which is, do you have any tools, resources, or advice for uh, nonprofits that have small staff who are a little overwhelmed by the concept of also having a social media presence? Yeah, I, I think the challenge is the opportunity cost of doing many things. Uh, Warren Buffett is a great quote, diversification is for people that don't know what they're doing, right? And like that sounds simple because it's Warren Buffett. However, I do think there's some uh, value into that. So uh, I would test multiple channels, but then really try to figure out one that you're going to do very well at. I think there's opportunity to recreate content and post it at different pieces. But what kind of organization are you? Are you a Facebook organization, a TikTok? Are you going to be website, grant, high net worth? You, you know, everything needs to be aligned to do less better. Uh, so I would take a step back, figure out where do you think that the revenue is going to come from? Is it corporations, individuals, again, wherever? and then develop a strategy to resonate with that audience. Uh, I've seen a lot of organizations that try to be everything to everyone and they don't gain ground. Thank you so much, Nick. Carly, back over to you. Any thoughts, particularly for our small staff nonprofits? Sure, coming from several small staff nonprofits, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'll keep it short. I would say that one thing that seriously helped me a lot when it would come to when it came to having a social media presence without spending all my time on it was having a story bank. You really need to keep organized and you need to have things clearly written of what they were, what was the date, who's in the photo. And I know that sounds like a lot of work and it is. Um, but how many times as a nonprofit professional have you seen the incredible work that your organization is doing firsthand in front of you? You're in the community. And then afterwards you say, oh, I wish someone had snapped a photo of that. I wish I had that. Um, well, the thing is, somebody probably did snap a photo of that. It's probably a volunteer or uh, maybe somebody else on staff. And if you have a story bank ready for them to just put those photos and videos in there for you, um, that's half the work, just the collection. and um, the thing like we do actually do that at memory fox we remove all those barriers because we help you with the tagging and you have your story bank all the time and nobody when they're submitting their photos they don't have to download anything so that is a little bit of a way you can overcome that um but i would just say in general you need to be asking people constantly to submit those photos and videos to you um, because you are going to use those it, next year when you're when you're still talking about that same fundraising event you're going to wish you had those and I just don't want you to regret not collecting them in real time. Great, thank you so much, Carly. All right, Ira, over to you. Thoughts and advice for our small staff nonprofits. 
Yeah, I think the, uh, yeah, I agree definitely with, with everything Nick and Carly said. Um, I, the, the thing that I always encourage, especially when, when you're thinking of something like video strategy or something like that, is you can keep it simple. You don't have to like create a Steven Spielberg directed video that, that needs to be posted. You can just take your iPhone and just shoot a 30 second thing. Um, if you're running an event, for example, or maybe a raffle and you want to show off your what you're raffling, you can take a quick 30, 30 second video and just kind of show it, shoot it with your iPhone and leave it unpolished. And those things tend to be a lot more effective. And so what I always recommend is, is a lot of times not overthinking it. And while there is a lot that you have to think of and make sure you're doing right, um, the content can be simple. You can kind of let go of your messaging a little bit. You don't worry about making mistakes. People love bloopers if you if you you know have a little mistake in, in your video or something. Uh, so I think there's there's a lot of ways to to kind of uh, let go of your messaging, keep it a little more simple, and uh, make it easy for your supporters to interact with. Great, thank you so much, Ira. Nick, a question for you from registration. I think you touched on this a little bit, but I'd love to hear some more. Someone asked, how can we effectively convert our social followers into donors and supporters? They're following us on social media, but we haven't seen the donations come in. Well, that's exactly what Good United does, right? So we turn your Facebook followers into repeat revenue through our conversational messaging platform. So I think the so what is that in these channels, they have messaging solutions. Right. So they want to keep you. The business wants to keep you in that channel. So in and how do you turn it? You, a follower you use a messenger. Right. So that's where you should be focusing. So everything they've done is to optimize the experience of going from follower to messenger. Then now you have a new channel that you can follow up with. And what's really neat about this new channel um, is that people open what you send them. And so in regards to stop sort of suicide, we actually skipped email. We didn't put any effort into it. We skipped direct mail. We didn't put any effort into it. We built a social following, monetized the social following, and the data that we collected, both email address and direct mail, allowed us to build those revenue lines 10 years down the road. Great. Anyone else have anything they want to jump into in terms of making a follower a donor? Sure, I'll just hop in quickly. Um, I'll just say that that was awesome. Thank you, Nick, for sharing that. And then um, just another way that is kind of fun to make a follower a donor is through those peer to peer campaigns. So if you have somebody who is sort of like an influencer type in your community and they're promoting your peer to peer event and you have and they know friends and family who are being a part of it, they're just more likely to be a part of that fundraising campaign as well. So peer to peer, that's where it's at. Fantastic. All right. Unbelievably, we are getting towards the end of our hour, and I do want to make sure we wrap up a little bit early rather than a little bit late. So I'm going to ask one final question to each of our panelists to make sure we hear from you a final time. I'm going to admit that this is a slightly big and broad question, but it is very much my favorite question to end on, so I hope you will uh, entertain it. And Ira, I'll have you start us off. What do you see as the future of social media for nonprofits, and how can nonprofits get ahead today? Right. Um, you know, obviously, you know, a few years ago, nobody knew what TikTok was and and if it was, you know, how long it was going to last. And there have been, honestly, for every TikTok, there are a dozen Elios that don't last and, and stuff like that. So um, so I think that for, for me, what I always focus on is definitely the, 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 the community is moving more in video and more kind of that short term engagement uh you know bursts of content so what i always focus is again kind of go where the platforms are go what they're what the big influencers are doing out there and and follow similar tactics uh to do it so being funny focus on engagement showing your personality is is something that's that's um really important um building in that urgency when you're communicating with folks uh those tend to be the things that that we focus on and uh encourage people to to get ahead of because if you are focusing on some of that then uh you're kind of always going to be ahead of the curve wonderful thank you so much ira nick over to you thoughts on the future of social media for nonprofits and how can we can get ahead today yeah i don't think we're going to go backwards in technology right so generally what people do in technology get more decentralized so people continue to shift where they spend time. I mean, I can't believe that people watch other people play video games. And I can't believe that people donate to watch other people play video games, which shows that I'm not part of that demographic. However, what we're seeing is more and more platforms coming up 
to serve niche audiences, which I think creates a massive opportunity for nonprofits to figure out where their audience is and really to dominate that social channel. So what I would say is do not fight against the world's strongest and most powerful engineers on the planet. Go with the stream, meet people where they're at, engage with them in the channels where they want to spend time, and then ask them to give where they spend time, and you'll probably see success. So embrace it. Don't fight it. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. All right, Carly, over to you. Thoughts on the future and how we can get ahead today? Yeah, I agree with Ira and Nick. If I could predict the future of social media, then I would, you know, be a billionaire because that would be, you know, that's what a lot of other people are doing, right? Um, but I would, I agree that we don't go backwards. So everybody, we need to get on board and do video content, short form video content. That is what people are loving to watch. I know that's what I watch a lot of. Um, and really just in in anticipation for what might come in the future again i just really recommend having that story bank available where you have the video content the photos the written testimonials so you can adapt quickly when something does happen i don't know what might come after TikTok, but you might need video or photo or written text for that so let's make a story bank and make sure that we have all of those um, like specifically for a fundraising event um, like I was saying before, you need to make sure that you're collecting content this year that you're going to use to promote that event for next year. So in that way, that is the future, your future social media, at least. And um, and I would just say one way that I would recommend making sure that you are able to do that, because you probably personally as the nonprofit person running the event might not have time. Make sure you find a volunteer that's willing to do it um, or maybe somebody that is an intern that somebody uh, that can go around and make sure that you're having things collected at the events because it's really just going to make you happier in the future that you prepared ahead of time. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Carly. All right. With that, we have reached the end of our panel. I want to give a big thank you to our panelists. I know if we were in an in-person setting, there would be a round of applause. So just know I'm sending that to you emotionally through the screen today. I do also want to give a big thank you to our audience. I hope you all enjoyed yourself, learned something, can bring something that you learned with you into the amazing work that you're already doing. I also hope you will join us for some future NX Unite panels. We have a packed spring and summer ahead of us with a whole range of topics from major gifts, best practices to nonprofit tech innovation more uh, marketing panels and more. So keep your eye out on the NX Unite website, NX Unite LinkedIn, and you can even find me on LinkedIn and I'll keep you up to date on everything that's happening. And very, very quickly, I want to recommend that you have not already, if you have not already made a free NX Unite account, I highly recommend that you do if you intend to play to attend, goodness, a tongue twister today. If you intend to attend future NX Unite panels, um, that way when you attend these sessions, you're gonna start earning what's called cause coins. And when you amass enough of those, you're gonna get some discounts on industry software and some free consultations with some of our friends in the industry via our rewards program. So if you're already gonna be spending time with us, I just want you to get that extra benefit. All right, that is it for me. Again, a huge thank you to our audience and to our panelists. Really appreciate your all's time and I hope you all have a nice rest of your day. Bye, everyone.